We will go ahead and get started. It is 105. Thank you for everyone that's being on time. Wanted to welcome you to our event featuring Holocaust survivor speakers. My name is Talene Partikian, and on behalf of our teaching and learning department, I would like to welcome all of the students and teachers to this very special event. Today, we come together to listen to the firsthand accounts of individuals who endured one of the darkest chapters in our history. As we listen to their stories, let us reflect on the resilience, courage, and strength of these survive, that these survivors embody. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to our speakers for sharing their experiences with us. It is through their voices that we gain a deeper understanding of the human spirit's capacity to endure and overcome adversity. I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Mr. David Meyerhoff. He's a retired middle school teacher from LA Unified School District who has helped Glendale Unified for the past few years coordinating the speaker series event. His parents and grandparents were also Holocaust survivors. Mr. Meyerhoff has devoted his life to education and to the preservation of the Holocaust survivor stories like his family's as well. I now turn it to Mr. Meyerhoff to introduce our guest speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is David Meyerhoff. I'm the Holocaust Speaker Coordinator for the Glendale Unified District. And students, you are the last generation to hear our Holocaust survivor speakers. It is a very important and meaningful program that you're going to listen to. Um, our speaker, Mr. Raul Artal, it was born in 1943 in hiding in, in a Nazi concentration camp, Rashad Transnistria in Western Ukraine, known in Holocaust history and literature as the Forgotten Death Trap. The camp was liberated by the Red Army when he was one year old and both parents survived. He grew up in four different countries, five different languages. Despite the challenges, has had a most successful and rewarding academic career. Now you will be witnesses to the Holocaust. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raul Artal. Thank you very much, Mr. Meyerhoff. It's, it's a pleasure being with you. I, I hope that uh, one day we can uh, meet in person, but we are also uh, blessed of having uh, Zooms. <laughs> So uh, I will uh, I will share with you a chapter of the Holocaust that it's not known to too many, because uh, the territory where those events occurred was under communist rules for for many years, and they uh, suppressed uh, information about the Jewish victims. Uh, let me see. I I. If I can, um, a little bit uh, about the geography. Here you can see a map of Romania, and to the uh, east of Romania, east of uh, the Romanian Moldova, uh, is the area that was designated during World War II uh, as a killing field uh, and was called Transnistria, uh, translation from Romanian beyond the river Dniester. And the territory was an ideal geographic uh, area because it confined this territory by two rivers, by the rivers Dniester and Buk. Uh, over, uh, 150 to probably close to 300,000 uh, Jews were deported there from uh, uh, areas north of Romania called Bukovina and Basarabia. Uh, the capital of Bukovina was Chernovitz, which in the uh, uh, a quote of uh, a very famous uh, uh, writer, Paul Celan, uh, Chernovitz, was the city where books, where people and books lived. 
Transnistria ex existed as a territory between 1941 and 44. The capital of Transnistria at that time was Odessa. Uh, this is uh, the place where I was born, Bershad, was one of many concentration camps. And uh, this is how uh, nowadays Bershad looks like. Although I was told that not much has changed since World War II. How did my parents get there? Between 1933 and 1940, more than 1,400 anti-Jewish laws were passed by Nazi Germany. Sadly, anti-Semitism that has driven those deportations uh, exists to this day. And uh, this is the oldest hatred and the, of uh, of hatred of the Jewish people that has persisted to, to this day. And there are reasons given for the anti-Semitism and Holocaust. There were anti underlying psychological mechanisms. Among them, there is the religious anti-Semitism, which persists in cer certain countries. Uh, Jews were collectively blamed for the death of Jesus Christ. Then there is the racial anti-Semitism. The Jewish are both smart, but genetically inferior. Uh, the Nazi Germans called the Jews to be untermenschen, uh, subhumans. There, are, there is the economic anti-Semitism that all Jews are rich, far from truth. And then there is the political anti-Semitism persisting in certain countries. Jews were considered communists by the Nazis and bourgeois by the communists. It's sad to see that anti-Semitism has persisted for so many years. In uh, 2021, in the United States, there were 2,700 uh, anti-Semitic, major anti-Semitic uh, incidents. And sadly, that continues to rise. Hitler believed in the myth of powerful Jews, that the Jews are powerful and uh, dominate the world. And at the Nazi leadership uh, uh, conference at Vancey, uh, nice place uh, 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 at the outskirts of Berlin, near a lake, uh, they reached the final solution for the Jewish questions. What should we do with the Jews? Well. They decided to exterminate the Jews through work. And those that could not work, just eliminate immediately. Jews had to be finished one way or another. A decision by the Nazi Germany. Jews were considered by Nazi Germany as being genetically inferior. Being Jewish, was considered an incurable disease. They were all considered to be genetically inferior. Uh, ironically, or the facts are that in uh, modeled fetal risk for genetic disorders, actually the Ashkenazi Jews, which were all condemned to death by the Nazis, have less genetic disorders than the Northern European to whom Nazi Germany belongs. During World War II, Nazi Germany has established over 30,000, close to 50,000 uh, concentration camps, extermination camps, uh, ghettos all over Europe. Transnistria, right here to the right corner between the rivers. Uh, Agnester and Buk and Bershat right here in the middle. And Odessa, which at that time was the capital of that place, of the territory of Transnistria, is right here. The pearl on the Black Sea. It was considered one of the most uh, cultural and educated uh, place in the world. It's important to point out that Nazi Germany, when they uh, declared themselves that they would like to eliminate all the Jews, did not know how to identify the Jews and the general population. And one of the facts that uh, it's not generally known 
that IBM came to the assistance of Nazi Germany and invented the first computers in the world to identify this one purpose and one purpose only, to identify the Jews and the general population. And some of you may uh, still remember the uh, punch card that used to be used on the first computers at uh, years back. A little bit about my family that did not make it through World War II. These are my grandparents on my uh, mother's side. Uh, my uh, grandmother, Sonia, here on the left, had nine children and my mother was the youngest of nine. And my uh, grandfather, Gitsis, actually was the mayor of a city, uh, the city of Kutin in uh, Bessarabia. And he was also a, a pharmacist, was a very respected individual. This is, this is my mother and one of her colleagues at the famous music conservatory in Chernovitz. My mother was uh, in this photo just a few months before World War II erupted. She was trained as, as a concert pianist and she just gave a few uh, piano concerts uh, before she was uh, deported to a slave concentration camp. On my father's side, uh, uh, this was Samuel Mittelmark, uh, uh, my uh, grandfather on my father's side. Uh, prior to World War II, uh, of World War I, he was trained as a, constant, uh, as a construction engineer and owned a company that, that uh, was, uh, uh, there was building uh, freeways and uh, roads and uh, also uh, forestry. Uh, he died prior to World War II, uh, actually uh, during World War I, he was recruited into the Imperial uh, Army of uh, the Emperor of Austria at that time, uh, Franz Joseph, who was uh, very sympathetic to the Jews and actually uh, during his reign in Vienna, he donated money uh, to uh, build a synagogue in Jerusalem. Uh, my uh, grandfather, during World War I, was caught by, on the Russian front and uh, was imprisoned for four years in, in a Russian uh, prison before he came back uh, to Vienna, Austria. Here is my father in the front row, front row with uh, his sister on his left, uh, his older uh, brother in the back, and uh, my grandmother, uh, Rosa. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a last photograph of my wife's family in Poland. The entire family of uh, my wife, uh, Michal, was murdered in Poland during World War II for one reason and one reason only, they were Jewish. These are the sites of the 50,000 or so uh, ghettos, concentration camp, extermination camps uh, that were set up by the Nazis and their uh, uh, allies. Bershat somewhere around here, and here was Odessa, Crimea, uh, and Kiev. It's important to point out that at Kiev, near Kiev, the, uh, one of the most horrific massacres occurred during World War II at, Yad, at uh, uh, near Kiev in a ravine where 33,000 uh, Jews were murdered. Uh, and, and that was uh, here near Kiev. <clears throat> uh, Jewish people were all summoned. Here you can see mothers, grandmothers, and children before they were loaded on uh, uh, cattle wagon trains on their way to concentration camps. At concentration camps, many of them were set up for immediate uh, murder of the Jewish people. Uh, here, a grandmother and her three grandchildren 
on the way to a gas chamber and uh, minutes later uh, they were killed and then burned and what was left of them just ashes while visiting Auschwitz on one occasion I came across this uh, poster and I always have tears in my eyes uh, uh, reading it the testimony of Lien Grimman. We were bullied out of the train and stood waiting. A truck arrived, stopped near us, and on the truck were all the women and children. In the center, my wife was standing up with our baby, a picture I will never forget. All of them were supposed to have gone to undress and then to the gas chambers. Two hours later, these people, my family, were ashes, including my wife and child. While on one visit to the concentration camp to Auschwitz, I took along my, my daughter and my granddaughter, Nava, and I caught this photo with my granddaughter in front of a, a big poster of mothers and their children on the way to gas chambers. And the horrible thought occurred to me that my kids and my grandkids could have been also on their way to gas chambers if they would have lived during uh, World War II in Europe. This is a photograph that I have taken at Matthausen in the gas chambers. On the wall of this gas chamber, you can see multiple scratches of people trying to climb the walls and get the last gasp of air before they succumb to the gas, to the killing gas. During the selection process, those fit to work was immediately transferred to slave labor camps. And here you can see those that were selected to work as slaves. <clears throat> At Majdanek, under this roof, there are the ashes of hundreds and thousands of Jewish people that were massacred and their remains were burned in the ovens. Here you can see the leftovers at Auschwitz of uh, Jewish victims that arrived here and their belongings still left left by the uh, train station. And all of these people were taken to the gas chambers and killed and burned. <laughs> this is a photograph that I have taken at Auschwitz of a carpet made of human hair. Women, when they got to the concentration camp, they were shaved and their hair used for to make carpets. And the bunker of Hitler a carpet was found, a carpet <clears throat> made of human hair. Here are glasses of victims. Not, not far from all the concentration camps, there were villages, towns, where people knew what was happening close by, but they were totally distance and uh, did not take any actions to help the Jews. <clears throat> A few historical factors, the facts. Hitler's most loyal ally was Ion Antonescu, the leader of Romania. He was the fascist dictator. In 41, occupied Bessarabia and Bukovina, where my parents lived. And he started uh, deporting the Jews to concentration camps in Transnistria. For joining Nazi Germany, Romania was awarded, quote unquote, the territory of Transnistria. Also, there was a Ukrainian militia uh, at that time that joined the Gestapo and the Nazis, a minority in the Ukrainian population. And about 110,000 Jews from Bessarabia and Bukovina among them, my parents were forced 
out of their uh, homes on death marches to Transnistria. Here you can see uh, Jewish victims on the way to the concentration camps on a death march. And here in the front, you can see two Romanian uh, soldiers, fascist Romanian soldiers, and to their uh, left, a Ukrainian uh, guard. Mothers and children and babies on the way to the concentration camp. And here are Romanian soldiers watching that. My parents, along with 1,200, 1,200, 500 Jews, were forced through the forest on their way to the concentration camp. My mother, who left uh, uh, many letters to, for me, uh, described that as a horrible ordeal. And in the letter, uh, and I uh, uh, quote here, she said, Dear Auli, it was late October, freezing cold rain, sleet, and sadly, we could see everywhere on the trail many dead bodies. In Ukrainian freezing cold, children were thrown to the side of the trail, um, dead children. We were allowed to rest, rest overnight in the forest. We were hungry and thirsty and frozen. Hunger was the most difficult torture for, of all. And she left for me many description of these marches and also the fact that when they got to the concentration camp where they were assigned uh, to Bersha Transnistria, that camp was run, uh, run by a, a killing uh, uh, action group uh, and German Einsatzgruppen D. Uh, the commander of that Einsatzgruppen D was a guy by the name of Otto Ollendorf. Uh, actually, all the commanders of the killing squads, there were four killing squads, they, all of them had academic degrees. Otto Ollendorf had a doctor degree in economics, and the, um, the commander of Einsatzgruppen C, uh, Otto Rash had two uh, doctor's degrees, and he used to insist to be called doctor, doctor. It is estimated that those uh, 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 killing squads uh, killed about uh, 1.2 to 1.5 million or more of Jews in Bukovina, Buko, uh, Bessarabia, and uh, Northern Romania, and the uh, killing fields of uh, Transnistria and Ukraine. <clears throat> It's important to come across this uh, order of the day given by the commander of these troops, of the Nazi troops uh, in October of 41 before they invaded uh, uh, USSR, Russia. And, uh, uh, and where they insisted the necessity of cruel and just revenge against the subhuman uh, jury. The Sixth Army, the killing uh, 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 squad, Einsatzgruppen uh, C and D, and Ukrainian auxiliary massacred all the Jews on their way. In one location at Bila Tserkava, they killed 90 children, uh, despite objections by the attached army chaplains. And the same uh, killing squads killed about 33,000 Jews at Babi Yars. Babi Yar is a, a valley uh, at the outskirts of Kiev, and in their own word, they killed them for revenge, for being Jewish. Here is uh, Hitler uh, celebrating uh, the victories, quote unquote, on on the Eastern Front, and being saluted by admirers, including children. At Bogdanova, one of the most horrible massacres. A typhus epidemic erupted there, and uh, <clears throat> Jews were all locked up in these structures and burned alive. <clears throat> On the ways to the concentration camps, uh, Jews were forced to dig trenches about every 15 miles or so, and those that could not walk any longer uh, were killed there and uh, some of them burned even alive. Here is a mass grave of several thousand Jews at Proskurov, at one of those places in Ukraine. One of the other hor horrific things that, used, that occurred 
during World War II that in many of those dead marches, uh, young women was forced to undress and they paraded the naked through the city of villages which they occupied, which the Nazis and their allies, the fascist Romanian occupied. Those women were raped and after they were raped, believe it or not, they threw them alive into uh, livestone burning stoves, threw them alive into those stoves. This is a famous uh, photograph found at many uh, concentration camps and uh, for, has some significance in that the uh, Nazi German soldiers were instructed to save bullets. And in those cases where uh, there was a mother and a child the, uh, uh, the, as victims, the mother was instructed to raise the child to, uh, to the level where the soldier can kill both mother and child with one bullet. To this day, it's not known how many uh, Jewish people died on the camps of Ukraine. It was estimated by Father Dubois that over a million and a half Jews were killed there. I had the honor to meet Father Dubois, uh, an incredible uh, personality. Uh, he took upon himself to discover how many uh, people, Jewish people, were killed in the camps of Ukraine. And he came up with uh, uh, the uh, uh, idea that uh, uh, to recover uh, bullets at each mass graves, uh, and uh, he had uh, uh, workers with uh, metal detectors recovered uh, bullets at each mass grave, and by counting the bullets, he, he could uh, know with uh, quite accuracy as to how many people got killed at each location. And his estimate about a million and a half Jews were killed in the camps of Ukraine. And the, and the words and the words of Wall Street Journal, Father Dubois is a generation too late to save lives. Instead, he has saved memory and set history. <clears throat> Here is the river Dniester, and beyond you can see the hills here, it's Transnistria. The, uh, among these uh, Jewish deportees, before they crossed into Transnistria, they were kept here. My parents could have been here. After they uh, crossed into uh, Transnistria, they were not fed, and uh, they had to uh, survive this whatever they could by digging for uh, potatoes on the fields of uh, Transnistria. Uh, convoys of deported Jews from Besabar Besarabia and Bukovina, from where my uh, parents were uh, deported, were marched to an abandoned village. Uh, uh, Bershat was uh, actually half of Bershat was transformed into a concentration camp and my uh, parents were uh, imprisoned there. <clears throat> Those fit for slave work, like my parents, were kept alive. The remainders, many of them were executed. Some died of typhus, some of hungers, and some of uh, cold weather. My mother always told me that the worst of all the suffering was hunger because they were and they were never fed. That hunger was the most horrible uh, um, torture of all. This is a photograph that I took of the concentration camp in Bershad a few years ago. Uh, I was told that that part of Bershad has never changed since World War II. It is um, estimated that approximately of the 25,000 Jews, including my parents, that were sent there, only about 1,900 survived among them, my parents and I. <clears throat> this is the photograph that I've taken, the photo of 
of the uh, synagogue in uh, in Bershad, <clears throat> which is centuries old. And uh, during World War II, about 200 Jews hid in this building. The uh, uh, guards did not enter the synagogue because they were afraid of contagious disease. And um, somehow they survived in this structure. This is a famous photograph. <clears throat> Bershad concentration camp was in a region called Vinitsa. N near Vinitsa, um, near the city of Vinitsa, the uh, Nazi Germans built a bunker for Hitler from where he was supposed to direct the assault on Moscow. Uh, he visited the place only once. He never uh, got a chance to direct an attack on Moscow. However, in anticipation for his visit, of the visit of Hitler, of that bunker, uh, the Nazi German soldiers uh, killed all the Jews in the region of Vinitsa. And this photograph was found in the pocket of this Nazi uh, German uh, soldier, and on the back of the photo was written in German, the last Jew in Vinica. Babies were born at all the concentration camps. <clears throat> and uh, here are pregnant women at Auschwitz. About 3,000 babies were born at, uh, at, uh, at Auschwitz. About 15 of them survived and they got together a few years ago at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. Assisting those deliveries was a, a nun. Uh, her name was Stanislava Lezinska, which is considered to be a saint. Uh, she tried to save as many as possible uh, Jewish mothers uh, and Jewish babies. And uh, after she, she would deliver the babies, uh, she would hide the babies between the legs of the women and uh, cover them with newspapers and send them uh, on gurneys to the barracks at Auschwitz. And the reason why uh, these babies were not uh, discovered is because the guards, the soldiers, were afraid to go into the barracks, not to catch any of the contagious uh, diseases that were rampant. Uh, at that time. <clears throat> uh, for, for the killing of uh, Jews, uh, there were four uh, killing squads set up, as I indicated before. And uh, the killing squad responsible for the killing of Jews in the area where my parents were deported to Bersha Transnistria, the commander of that killing squad was Otto Ollendorf. At the Nuremberg uh, trials in, uh, in, in, uh, after the war, Otto Ollendorf was uh, asked, why did you kill children? And he said, well, children were going to grow up and when they will find out what happened to their parents, they will try to seek revenge. So he personally acknowledged the killing of 90,000 Jewish people. Uh, Jewish people and children did hide in many places in Europe. And this is a photograph taken at actually at Warsaw. <clears throat> in many of those places, uh, Jewish partisans tried to fight the Nazi army with some minimum success. My father also joined the uh, Jewish partisans in Ukraine, and you may have seen some movies about the Jewish partisan in Ukraine that fought the Nazi German army. This is a letter given to my father. It's written in Russian, uh, acknowledging his participation in, in those uh, uh, fights against the Nazi Germans and their allies that 
fascist Romanian soldiers. <clears throat> this is a letter from the museum in Jerusalem acknowledging the re receipt of the letter. In Bershad, there, <clears throat> there were two, two teenagers that were serving as a liaison between the people in the camp and the partisans in the area. And they were discovered <clears throat> doing, <clears throat> doing that and they were sadly executed. <clears throat> My father was also taken out, was taken out for execution in Bershat. When he, he got to the place where the execution were taking place at the local cemetery, my father noticed a lot of uh, uh, cadavers on the ground, on the frozen ground, ground. And he fell to the ground pretending to be dead also. The guards did not notice. And um, he, he survived the execution and returned to the, to the camp, to the place where my mother and other who were uh, incarcerated in <clears throat> one of those houses. This is a uh, uh, painting by a famous Israeli uh, painter, Arnold Dagani, who was also incarcerated in the same concentration camp like my parents. And this is his uh, uh, artist rendition of that uh, uh, cemetery in Bershat. <clears throat> I visited Bershat and all what's left there is this uh, monument commemorating the killings of thousands of Jews in that location. In conclusion, the Holocaust in Ukraine is considered the forgotten Holocaust. 70% of Ukrainian Jews died on a Ukrainian soil. It is estimated that between 1.3 and 2.5 million uh, Jewish people perished in the Ukrainian camps, not known to this day. Uh, the only place in Europe that took care of their Jews and saved their Jews was Denmark. Denmark rescued all their Jews by uh, shipping them to Sweden, which was a neutral country and the Nazi Germany never invaded. January 43 is when the Red Army started their victory at Stalingrad. <clears throat> I was born there. However, I was hidden in the camp in Bershad for close to a year until the uh, Soviet Red Army liberated the camp. When they liberated the camp, the soldiers were instructed not to allow any uh, of the evacuees on their, on their uh, trucks because of the fear of disease. However, my mother who was fluent in Russian was able to convince some Russian soldiers to allow my father herself and, and me to uh, uh, get on a track to the first uh, city uh, of Mogilev. And while on the track, one of the soldiers pulled out a piece of chocolate and gave me that uh, piece of chocolate. I never had any solid food before and I did spit that uh, uh, piece of chocolate. And uh, the uh, soldiers burst in laughter and one of them said to my mother, don't worry, he will grow up and become a great commander in the Red Army. My mother, who was trained as a musician, she never missed a beat. She replied, no, my son will, will become a doctor. And indeed, I did become a doctor. I was one of the lucky children that survived World War II. This concludes my, uh, my, my history that I shared with you. And here is my uh, father, uh, deportee uh, ID, and actually my 
my birth certificate. You can see my name here inscribed. Raul, born in 1943. Coming back, there was no welcome for the Jews in Russia. They were be, being deported to Siberia because the communists considered the Jews to be bourgeois. And uh, uh, it's uh, ironic that the Nazi Germans and their allies considered the Jews to be communist. There was no welcome home. And this concludes my remarks and we'll be happy to answer any questions if we have any time left. Well, thank you very much. Um, students, can we give some applause to our speaker today? Actually, I was wondering if you could expand something um, about how your mother survived. You you well, talked about your father. But... My, my parents were, were lucky. And in that camp, about 1,500 people survived. I think one reason why they survived is the uh, the uh, the uh, guards were afraid to get into the structures, not to catch any of the contagious disease that were uh, rampant at that time. <clears throat> and actually, on one occasion, uh, they were searching for children, for babies. And you won't believe what my mother did. She found out that the uh, uh, guards would go from one structure to another and commandeer the people to come out with their children. And my mother uh, uh, found out what they are doing. She ran out of from the back of the half-destroyed house or my parents in other uh, joint to the back of the house and I ravine. And where would you hide not to be discovered? You will never guess. My mother had the intuition that the uh, Nazi German uh, uh, guards will never search in the ravine backyard of the commander of the camp. And she hid with me in the bushes in the ravine a ravine behind the house of the commander of the camp. And after a few, a couple of days, she returned at, at night to the place where my, my father and others were sharing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Have, um, have you written this? Well, actually I'm in the process of writing a memoir and uh, it, it's not easy. It's uh, quite difficult for me, but, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm, I'm almost done. Wow. Actually, before we get to the questions, I wanted to know if you would like to uh, give a message to our students uh, about their responsibility in talking about today's world. Well, uh, first of all, we, we have to accept the fact that we're all born equal. And in the mo modern and uh, progressive societies uh, ours, there is no room for hatred, for uh, anti-Semitism, for racial discrimination. And it's very sad to see that anti-Semitism is uh, spreading around the country. There is no room for anti-Semitism in a modern and advanced progressive society. Mm -hmm. Those students, um, you have questions, you know, and to me, I always, told my students, there's no such thing as a wrong question or a bad question. So, you know, and, and we're, we're asking you to write thank you letters that involve what you learned today 
and how do you feel about what you've learned? Can you relate what you've learned to your own family history? And how is today's presentation relevant to today's world? It is completely relevant. It's completely um, important to what is occurring. Where was your wife from? And do you have a family and children? There's a first question. <laughs> well, if I may add, uh, I would like to leave you with a major, uh, with a message that we are all born uh, equal, but not only that, never give up, never give up, uh, especially when you promote uh, truth, equality, and respect for each other. Wonderful. Um, where was your wife from? And do you have a family and children? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I, I met uh, my wife, Michal, in, in Israel. Uh, we were uh, both uh, uh, soldiers at that time. We, uh, we decided um, when we finished our military service to study together medicine. And at that time, uh, there was only one medical school in Israel and uh, we, uh, we decided to, uh, to, to go to a country which uh, facilitates um, admission to their school to everybody and the selection is made through exams and that's Italy. So Italian actually became my fifth language. And uh, you have to also know that uh, all the exams in Italy were oral. So I had to learn Italian really fast. What are the other languages you know? My my first language was German. My parents uh, were uh, conversing in German. Second language uh, was uh, uh, Russian because <clears throat> in uh, Russia after the war, we had a Russian babysitter. And then my third language was Romanian. Uh, the fourth language was English. We came to the States my parents and I came to the States and they decided to, to Israel. Um, they uh, encountered some anti-Semitic uh, incidents here in this country and they didn't want to live in the States. So we moved to Israel. So uh, Hebrew became my fifth language. And uh, it was by far the most difficult language to learn because I, I had to become very proficient to be able to finish my high school. So uh, this was the fifth language and the sixth language, as I said, was Italian. <clears throat> what do you recall from your childhood? Oh, um, if a kind of related to my sharing my personal history is that um, the high school in Israel in my, in my class, there were uh, uh, two guys, uh, their parents were war criminals. One of them became a, um, uh, a close friend of mine and uh, was very nice. But the other one, his name was Potoraka. I used to get in frequent uh, uh, fist fights. He used to call me dirty Jew. And, uh, but I didn't stand for that. You were in the Israeli army? I was in the Israeli army, yes. And uh, I was in telecommunications and uh, my, my wife was in intelligence and uh, <clears throat> we both uh, were dating during our military service. And when we finished, we studied together. Wow. Um, 
once you hid with your mother and you found your father, did you keep running? I, I thought you were too young to run, but I don't know. <laughs> no, uh, when the camp was liberated, I was one year old. I, I think I can barely walk. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so but how old? Yeah, okay. But, you know, my parents uh, were very courageous and they were getting me whatever they want. How old were you when you when the war ended? One year old. When the war ended? Yeah, when it was liberated. Uh, uh, the war uh, ended up in Europe uh, f four years later, but, but that area of uh, Europe was liberated quite early. The Red Army, the Russian Army, liberated uh, Ukraine, and <clears throat> and then the area where um, uh, Bukovina, where my parents returned after the war. My <clears throat> my mother was, as I said, uh, I share with you. She was a concert pianist. She regained her uh, uh, her job as a uh, piano teacher at the music conservatory, and also gave some uh, piano concerts. And my father actually was <laughs> a construction engineer with expertise in uh, bridge building. And at that time, uh, while re uh, retreating, the Nazi German army uh, blew, blew uh, all the, the bridges when they retired. And my father was recruited by the Red Army to help uh, rebuilding the bridges. And uh, while on the field supervising the rebuilding of one bridge, he got shot in the leg by a member of the Bandera organization. Bandera organization was a far right organization that during World War II, they were fighting the Nazis, but after World War II, they were uh, quite anti-Semitic and also they were fighting the communists. So my father had the um, the <laughs> bad luck to get uh, shot in, in one leg and he spent several uh, weeks, actually three months in a hospital at that time there were no antibiotics and uh, luckily uh, they saved his leg. Oh. Where have you lived or visited with the least anti-Semitism? Israel. <laughs> there is no anti-Semitism in Israel. <laughs> How many countries have you been visited or been well or lived uh, or lived in? Well, uh, after. Uh, from uh, Ukraine, where I was born, we moved to Romania, from Romania to the States, from the States to Israel. Then uh, I um, <clears throat> finished uh, high school in Israel in <clears throat> military service and then got married. And uh, together with my wife, Michal, we went to study medicine in Italy. Italy has quite a unique uh, system. They don't have uh, admission exams. They ac uh, accept everybody that registers uh, for uh, uh, university studies. And then the uh, selection is made through exams at the end of the first year. So um, okay. we completed three years there and then we returned to Israel and completed medical school in Israel. We uh, uh, did our uh, post uh, uh, training uh, uh, expertise, uh, specialization training in Israel. We came for advanced specialization to the States and then uh, so many good opportunities came uh, our way that uh, we remained here, but uh, I uh, finished uh, my advanced training uh, in uh, high-risk obstetrics at uh, Harbor UCLA in uh, Los Angeles. 
actually my residency at uh, Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, uh, advanced training at Harbor UCLA. Uh, then I was uh, briefly on the faculty and then uh, I uh, got recruited to uh, 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 SUNY Syracuse as the chairman and then moved to uh, St. Louis University, a Catholic university where I was the chairman of a women's hospital for close to 16 years. And from there I uh, retired uh, back to California. <clears throat> so now you know all my secrets. <laughs> I, I do want to tell you, and I know I'm saying this in front of everybody, but my uncle was a engineer in Canada, Nova Scotia, at Halifax University. He was the dean, and he, in in building, he was ex his expertise was in bridges. And actually, there's a Meyerhoff principle that he discovered. I'm not sure, you know, I'll have to go research what that is, but I don't. It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah, I hope yeah. that one day I can meet each of you. Oh, yes. If there are no more questions from our students and teachers, oh, there's one. I, are you surprised by the increased anti-Semitism today and have you been affected by it? Well, well, I uh, unfortunately experienced episodes of anti-Semitism. And uh, it's sad to see that um, there is no sympathy for the Jewish people in certain circles. And um, in a modern and civilized society, uh, there is no room for anti-Semitism or any other hatred of any other uh, uh, segment of a population. And hopefully and th this group of, that uh, I met with today will uh, carry one message that we are all born equal and we should respect each other and uh, reject hatred. Mm -hmm. um, have you spoken in other, uh, around the country? You, oh, you've spoken around the world. Yeah, I, um, I did. I um, do deliver uh, on a regular basis um, talks for the Holocaust Museum here in Los Angeles and also the uh, Simon Wiesenthal Museum <clears throat> quite frequently, uh, also uh, by and large to high school children. And um, I was invited to several international uh, meetings to deliver talks actually. Uh, it's, um, I was invited to deliver a um, talk in Bucharest about the role of physicians during uh, World War II. And uh, it came to them as a surprise that I was a Holocaust survivor of, uh, that uh, my parents were sent out of uh, Romania. But, uh, it, it came to many people as a surprise, uh, the origin of the medical informed consent, that the medical informed consent originated at the trial of the Nazi physicians at Nuremberg, where the, uh, um, where the uh, judges mandated that no medical procedures should ever be conducted without an informed consent. Uh, sadly, not too many people know that. 
Yeah. It's there where they inform consent that you sign each time you go into a doctor's office originated at the Nuremberg trials of the Nazi physicians. Yeah. Are there any more questions? Well, if, if not, it was a pleasure meeting you all virtually, and hopefully we can meet some time in person. And uh, thank you so much for all you do. Thank you so much, Mr. Artal, for sharing your story with our GUSD students and teachers. We're really grateful to have this opportunity to, to hear your story. So thank you for being here. Um, Teachers, I did drop in the chat the details for the thank you letters. Students, we would love to hear from you. The questions are, are all emailed there in the chat. Um, so they're part of that details paper. We would love to hear your feedback and what you learned and, and the messages certainly that uh, Mr. Artel shared. Do remember those. And um, on behalf of our teaching and learning team, would like to thank you all for joining us today and for uh, Mr. Meyerhoff for moderating our session. We hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and Friday on more speakers. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, teachers. Oscar, come here. Oh, wait. Hey, let me introduce somebody. You have a visitor. Come here. I'm sorry, we, we have a lovely poodle and she's oh. by far our <laughs> best friend. She's shy, she doesn't want to come. <laughs> <laughs> but if you ever want to have a dog, get poodles. They, they are by far yes. the, the most loving and intelligent dogs that you can come across. That's cute. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye. I'll be in touch with you, Mr. He's coming. Aww. Oh. Yes. Look at how pretty she is. <laughs> the cute dog. This is Tosca. Tosca. That's a big dog. <laughs> yes. Yeah, All right. She's Thank you so much, dog. Mr. Artel. Pleasure meeting you. Bye-bye.